Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and today we're going to continue our pharmacology series by talking about the medication heparin. And after you get done watching this YouTube video, don't forget to access the free quiz that will test you on this medication. So let's get started. As we've been studying these medications in this series, we have been remembering the word nurse because this helps us remember those important questions we need to ask ourselves while studying these medications. So we're dealing with heparin. And sometimes you may see it written as unfractionated heparin. So the first thing we want to ask ourselves is what name, what family name does this drug fall into? Because that's going to tell us how this drug works. Well, heparin is part of the indirect thrombin inhibitor family. So it indirectly inhibits thrombin because it does this. This makes this drug an anticoagulant, which is going to alter the clotting process. Now, how does heparin do this? Well, it affects the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. And this pathway is activated when there is internal trauma to the vascular system compared to the extrinsic pathway, which is activated when there's external trauma which is how warfarin slash Coumadin really worked. It affected the extrinsic pathway, but heparin affects the intrinsic pathway. Now, how it specifically does this is that heparin will bind with a naturally occurring substance in the body. And when it does this, it enhances the activity of this substance, which we're talking about antithrombin-3. And antithrombin-3 inhibits inhibits the enzymes that will play a role in the clotting process. And it's specifically going to prevent the activation of thrombin. And if we prevent the activation of thrombin, we're going to alter clotting because we're going to prevent the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, which is going to result in slower clotting times for our patient and this will help prevent clots. And if they already have an existing clot, prevent that clot from getting bigger and potentially breaking off and going into circulation. Now, one thing heparin does not do is it does not lysis or break up an existing clot. And when we're talking about clots, one thing we're talking about is like venous thromboembolisms, VTEs. And a lot of times these start out as small little clots in the vessel. And we refer to those as deep vein thrombosis, DVT. And these clots can grow and they can break off and they can go into circulation. When they do this, it becomes an embolism. And these clots can travel throughout the body and cause a lot of problems. It can go to the lungs where we refer to that as like a PE, a pulmonary embolism or these clots can go to the heart circulation where the heart muscle is fed by those arteries and can block the circulation to the heart muscle and a myocardial infarction can occur. Or these clots can go up through the brain circulation, block blood flow to an area of the brain and lead to a stroke. So these clots can be very dangerous. Now let's ask ourselves, what is heparin used for? Why may our patient be on heparin? Well, we've already established heparin's an anticoagulant, so it's going to be used to prevent and treat blood clots in patients. Now, what kind of conditions may a patient have that heparin can treat? Well, patients who have those VTEs, those venous thromboembolisms, or a pulmonary embolism, Stroke help prevent a stroke where the clot can go and block the blood flow to the brain. For atrial fibrillation, whenever patients have this, their heart really isn't empty and like it should. Blood is pulling from those erratic impulses in the heart and a clot can form because anytime blood pulls together, clots can form. And we want to prevent like a clot being shot out of the heart and leading to a stroke or in certain cases of surgery, like cardiac surgery or some types of orthopedic surgery, like hip surgery, where there's an increased risk of clot development. Next, let's talk about the responsibilities of the nurse for a patient who is on heparin. So one thing you wanna know is how is heparin administered? Well, we can give it through an injection via the fatty sub-Q tissue or the IV route intravenously through a continuous infusion. So let's talk about the continuous IV route first. Whenever continuous heparin is ordered, we will hang a bag of it, and it's referred to as a heparin drip. And we will titrate this drip based on a protocol that has very specific guidelines that will be based on the patient's APTT result. And APTT stands for activated 
partial thromboplastin time. And that is what we care about with heparin. So remember that. And here in a moment, I'm gonna go in depth about this result. So based on this result, either we will increase the drip, give the patient a bolus, or we will turn the drip off for an hour, decrease the rate, or there'll be no change to the drip until the next APTT result. And the whole reason we're doing that is because we're trying to get this patient within this therapeutic range so we can prevent blood clots. So it has to be therapeutic for it to actually work because we can cause them too much bleeding or we can actually cause them where it's not working at all and they'll get blood clots. So with this heparin drip, this result will be drawled every like four to six hours. I've mainly seen it six hours. It depends on your hospital protocol. And before you start heparin, heparin is a weight-based drug. So you need to have an accurate current weight on that patient so proper dosing can be administered. So prior to giving this, make sure you have an accurate weight. So now let's talk about that activated partial thromboplastin time, that APTT. So what is the difference between a PTT versus an APTT? Well, they both measure the same thing, but the APTT has an activator added to it to speed up the clotting time, hence why it has that A in front of it. So it's gonna have a little bit more of a narrow range than your PTT, but they measure the same thing. So I wanted to quickly go over that because you may see those used interchangeably and I wanted you to know the difference. So these lab results, they measure those intrinsic and common pathways of the coagulation. So it's gonna tell us how long those coagulation factors are working to form a clot. And remember, whenever we have a patient on heparin, we want it to fall within a certain therapeutic range so we can prevent blood clots, but we don't cause them to excessively bleed. So these results are measured in seconds. Now, what is a normal APTT? A normal one is about 30 to 40 seconds, depending on the lab, that's an approximate range. So in order for a patient to be therapeutic, we want them to have a reading of 1.5 to 2.5 times the normal range of what this normal should be. So anywhere between 60 to 80 seconds, they would be therapeutic. So let's look at that range. If their APTT was less than 60, what would that mean? That would mean that they're not therapeutic. So we may, with their drip, have to possibly give them a bolus or increase their rate because they're not where we want them and they could develop blood clots. Now, if they were higher, on the higher spectrum, like greater than 80, what are they at risk for? Bleeding, because their clotting time is really prolonged. So we may, according to protocol, have to turn the drip off for an hour or decrease their rate. So with heparin, one thing I really want you to remember is about this APTT. It needs to be 1.5 to 2.5 times the normal range for that patient to be therapeutic. Now let's look at some more responsibilities, especially with the injectable heparin through the sub-Q tissue. As a nurse, we want to know where and how to give it. So remember these points. We want to, of course, administer it in the fatty tissue in the abdomen, but we want to stay at least two inches away from the belly button and one inch away from scars, because if you inject there, it's not really going to absorb because you have that scar tissue. Also rotate sites, so look in the chart, where did the previous nurse administer it, ask the patient, and always go on the opposite side. And whenever you give it, don't massage or aspirate or rub the injection site. Another thing we wanna do is monitor for bleeding. Anytime a patient's on any anticoagulant, they're at risk for bleeding, and it's usually gonna be in the most subtle places. So you wanna look after urine. Are they losing blood in their urine? Does it look yellow or does it look like a pinkish reddish tint to it that could indicate hematuria? And how does their stool look? Is it dark and tarry? That could be blood. That's referred to as melina. How does it look around their gums? Do they have oozing of blood? That can indicate we have some bleeding issues. 
And are they vomiting? If so, what does it look like? Does it look like coffee ground emesis that could indicate blood? And how does their vital signs look? Is their heart rate really high and their blood pressure low? We talked about this with our hypovolemic shock when a patient can hemorrhage that could indicate that. Or are they all of a sudden complaining of the severe sudden headache? can mean that we have some bleeding in our brain. And look at their labs. Have they have had a significant drop in their hemoglobin hematocrit level that's looking at our red blood cells? And how do their platelets look? Do they have a drop in their platelets? which can indicate heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So we want to be watching out for those things as well. Now let's quickly talk about this heparin-induced thrombocytopenia because it can happen to your patient who is on heparin and you want to be on the lookout for it. So what is it? Well, it's when antibodies are created against the heparin because it has bind with platelet factor four. So when the heparin and platelet factor four have bind, these antibodies are created, and they will go and attach to this complex. Once it attaches to this complex, it will activate the platelets. Whenever that happens, you're going to have problems. You're going to have small clots to form, and it's going to deplete our platelet count, hence thrombocytopenia. So that is really why we want to be looking at that CBC, those platelets, and see if they've dropped drastically, because if they have, patient could be going into this. Some other things you want to be looking out for other than that low platelet count is look, do they have any worsening or new clots that are developing? And depending on where that clot is will determine the sign and symptom. For instance, if they're going to get a new DVT, it could be a warm, hardened, swollen area. They have it in the lungs. It could be a chest pain, shortness of breath, the heart, things like that. Even going to the brain, they can have mental status changes. So you want to be always assessing those areas. Now, how about if this develops? What happens? Well, as a nurse, you can expect the heparin drip to be discontinued. It will be documented in the patient's health history that they have this and to never put them on heparin again. And they can be started on another anticoagulant, the family of the direct thrombin inhibitors like algatraban or bivalirudin, which is angiomax, to help with their anticoagulation. Some other things you want to remember with the responsibility part of heparin is the antidote. Always remember the antidotes for these medications. And the antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate. And whenever you give medications, always avoid the IM route because these patients are at risk for bleeding. It takes them a while to clot. So we want to avoid IM injections. And when drawing blood, we want to make sure that we hold firm direct pressure after drawing the blood because they can bleed for a while. And we want to prevent a hematoma from forming and also teach the patient about that as well. Especially if they get injured, they'll need to hold pressure for a while. This medication can be used during pregnancy. Warfarin could not be used during pregnancy. And speaking of warfarin, this medication heparin can be used as a bridge while a patient is being switched to warfarin because warfarin takes about three to five days for the patient to become therapeutic where the INR is between two to three. So they'll be on heparin during that bridging time. Then the heparin will be discontinued because, you know, heparin has a short half-life. Now let's talk about some side effects. Other than they can have the excessive bleeding and the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, you want to watch out for osteoporosis. This can occur in patients who take heparin long-term and in high doses because it can stimulate the osteoclast activity and inhibit osteoblast activity, which will alter the strength of the bone. So watch for bone fractures, things like that. And other side effects could be hair loss and rashes. And lastly, the education pieces for the patient taking heparin. You'll want to teach them how to monitor for signs and symptoms of that excessive bleeding, like looking at the urine, the stool, the gums, if they vomit, what does it look like? Things like that that they would need to report to their doctor. Also, using a soft bristle toothbrush so they don't cut the gums and cause it to bleed, and electric razors rather than the straight razors because they may cut themselves. Avoiding contact sports that they can become injured, have some type of trauma that um, because they're susceptible to bleeding that they could really have a major injury. 
Also avoiding taking aspirin, any type of NSAIDs or over the counter health vitamins because this can interfere with heparin and increase bleeding. And always talk to your healthcare provider before taking any new medications. And how to administer the sub-Q heparin. You'll want to demonstrate to the patient, show them, make them demonstrate back to you to make sure that they're doing it right. And to always let other healthcare providers know that they're taking heparin, especially prior to any type of invasive procedure. Okay, so that wraps up this review over heparin. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.